Good and evil exist and are not subjective, being only relative to each other, but neither of them are truth. Evil is a consequence of good, in the sense that it is rejected potential that lies within, but mostly hidden, from good. Good is proud and, as a consequence, it casts from itself the potential for evil, which is shameful. The pride inherent to good does not allow contemplation on any deviation from that self-image. Any deviation brings shame to the good, and so it must be either struck down or hidden away. This is why good, through its pride, applies shame on others as a tool of control. It becomes a righteous tyranny, ever demanding of a self-image that is almost impossible, if not actually impossible, putting everything in its path through an impossible Procrustean bed that nobody is able to fit. Shame is also a tool of projection by casting onto the other's effigy all of good's own sins, in the sense of deviations from that impossible good prideful self-image, in order to keep that self-image safe from self-scrutiny and contemplation, by hiding it away, by pointing it at others. Through this process, evil gains a life of its own. Evil was originally a created shadow counterpart, merely reflecting potentials of the good that were imperfections and aberrations to the proud self-image. But now, with the coming forward of that righteous tyranny, it is given animation and license to manifest. It becomes an opponent, or, more than that, an enemy. In contrast with good, being its reflection, evil is shameful and applies pride on others. Also, likewise, as a tool of control and projection. After all, it is a reflection, so evil will mimic the hidden potential behind good's pride. Like a Frankenstein monster, evil, having been rejected and abandoned by its creator, is fueled solely by the hatred emerging from that rejection and from the hypocrisy of the pride worn by good that rejects him for being ugly and shameful while hiding its own ugliness and shamefulness away from view. So evil will be moved solely by the urge to persecute and corrupt and invert everything that holds up good's proud self-image. Evil will even vie to convince everyone that it is the original being reflected and not the other way around. Both sides have heroes and villains, be them organically arisen or falsely scripted onto the stage of the world. Those who are scripted are a narrative tool, using the details of stories to attract the living to fuel and feed their desired outcome. Present the villains and their machinations, show the consequences of the villainy, and then bring in the heroes who defeat the evildoers and set things right. But this is not true. It may be factual in the world, but not the pure truth. That's what I mean. Like stated previously, this is not to say that there are no evil villains or good heroes in the world. They do arise organically too. However, both sides fighting each other in all else agree on one aspect. The world must be maintained. The show must go on. Because the alternative is ceasing to exist in their form. The conflict makes the game, and therefore gives both good and evil purpose. This game of conflict is also addictive. The pendulum will come and go from one side to the other, revealing the hidden reflections of each of them in the mirror of the world, but neither side willingly concedes to the ultimate truth. One holding on to pride and conditional love, and the other gripping hatred and shame. Both sides of this reflection in the mirror want victory, not truth, and this is why neither will ever 
ultimately win. Because the only way to win the game is truly not to play, and to admit and accept that the other side, be it ugly and degenerate or neat and righteous, is also their reflection. The quality of the game field one steps on, and of the opponent playing the game against oneself, shows the quality of the potentials hidden in the life being reflected in the mirror. This is an aspect seen in the movie Nines that has been on the recommendations playlist in this channel for quite some time, but that I haven't discussed previously. Recently, School Trap made a video about it and asked for my views, so I took the chance to contemplate on it again. It is recommended that you watch the movie before listening further, and, as stated, it can be found in the playlist named Recommendations to Contemplate On. The Nines is no doubt a great movie with truth drops in it. However, my contemplation led me to conclude that it isn't a truth-pointing myth, because its details overshadow the outline. Explaining this, the outline is that there is a Nine who creates this world and experience, and to make it thorough and believable, creates NPCs, Sevens, around him. Now the creator becomes so involved with his created world, because it reflects him, which is the world's reason of existence, that he becomes an addict. As such, he is incapable of turning away from the game and even forgets who he truly is. This is the outline and the truth drop behind the movie. However, in my view, the movie's details skew it and twist it, turning it into a hoax. For instance, the main nine in the movie is called G. Several names begin with that letter, but in the ending the blonde nine even calls him by G, which is the sacred letter of some secret societies that is at the center of the square and compass, for instance. However, those in those societies who are metaphorical nines are now game addicts, fallen souls, and whatever they do in the world, they do as an investment in the game and for the game not as a contemplation regarding what the game is reflecting about themselves. So it follows that G, the one depicted in the movie and the one being worshipped, is their addict egregore, in the same way that, for instance, Mr. Gold, here's the letter G again, is the addict egregore shown in the movie Revolver. If you've never watched it, you're missing out, it's a must. Also, at a certain point in the movie, it is stated that G is an actor and that if nobody's watching, then he doesn't exist. This too points towards G being an egregore and not a living essence. The living need nothing beyond their own life to exist. Egregores, however, require attention or worship to be fed. Be them on the side of good or on the side of evil. In fact, Egregores always need a side, a team, a cult, a priesthood to maintain them. Another aspect in the movie is that there is only one nine shown, which is G, apart from the knowing intervening ones who are not creating anything but only playing by his rules to save him because it's his created world. However, this implies, if nobody else is co-creating the world, and he's the only one, that the message is that for each nine there is a separate reality and world that never touches or overlaps with another's reality and world. This does not add up, because if so, then only one of us here, or none, but never both, could be a nine. Still using the movie's metaphorical terms here. Either you listening there would be the Nine, and me, a Seven or NPC, inhabiting your reality by your creation, while I'm thinking I'm a Nine, or it is the other way around, or none of us are Nines and we're both Sevens or NPCs. None of these possibilities can be true for the simple reason that an NPC by nature is incapable of transcendent thought that is, of their mind going beyond reality, 
because it is solely made up of that very reality. Sevens, or NPCs in the movie, could not by nature know and recognize the nines for what they are, much less know more about them and their origin and their history than them. However, other nines whose intention would be to keep their fellow nines interested in feeding and playing the game, can recognize and know and use that for that purpose on their fellow living souls. So it can only be that if we're both nines, then we're both contributing to the creation through self-reflection of mirror images onto the world, or in other words, the reflection of shadows. Also, we're fueling the world not as characters or personalities, but as essences that are beyond them. And so consequently, there are several other nines sharing our reality, but also several of them are reality addicts, addicted to characters and shadows and their conflict game, which is an aspect that is correctly presented in the movie. Anyway, ultimately, the attack of the shameful evil shadow, created from the reflection of the prideful good, will become so overwhelming that the good will have to confront evil, not able to cast it away anymore. Metaphorically, that happens when the pendulum nears the middle, with almost all of its momentum spent. Good will then have to eventually scrutinize evil, realizing that it is its own reflected potential, and, casting down its own pride, it also casts down the other's shame. This is the reason why, no matter what type of revolution comes to pass, be it from the good or the evil camps, it will always end up with the winners oppressing the losers, therefore generating more shadow reflection at a sub-level. This sort of reminds me of that quite disturbing track in the White Album by the Beatles called Revolution 9. Number 9, number 9, number 9, and so on. Maybe that is one of the reasons why the movie used that number to name the main characters in it. As mentioned in previous contemplations, this eternal wrestle match is played out analogous to the motion of a pendulum. It will travel to an extreme and the good will have the upper hand. Then it will naturally travel to the opposite extreme and the evil will then be winning. Every time the pendulum changes direction, it will lose momentum and the extremes will be less far from each other and the time between them lessens, approaching a middle point of stillness. That middle point is the healing of the world's mind, of which we all, as individual potentials, fractally representing the whole world's mind and soul in our own, contribute to one way or another. Right now, reality has made of the world a cartoon world, exactly to force the people to confront themselves. As stated also in previous presentations, many want vengeance, retribution for all that was done to them and their pride, under the guise of justice. Many want the opportunity to exert onto others the oppression that they were subject to, looking for licenses to be tyrants for a day, and so on. It is a call for a voluntary moral choice, not one that is done socially, politically, or on any of the facade levels, but one that is decided in each one's own internal temple. Many will prefer to become cartoon characters, caricatures, than to accept and face their own internal pride and shame. Now, I have to complement all this by stating that, again, only in my view, truth is neither good nor evil, but would be best described as pure. Truth is uncreated, immutable, and timeless. So anything that is subject to change, like good and evil are, is not true, nor is it the truth.